Welcome to um, Insights from Teaching and Research, um, Maximizing the Value of Data. I'm Adrian Stanley, the, the chair. Uh, I've been working with the program team, specifically Liz Allen, Simon Ross, and um, Astrid Engel. We've been putting together a, a sort of session broadly around data, but with some very sort of practical things you can take away. So there's, there's, a, there's quite a sort of a broad scope to what data is, but I hope you're going to see from, from this presentation here, um, and then the next, we, we've, uh, actually, click the next thing. We, we've actually got a whole data track or data train of presentations, so there's one following this presentation that's got some very short, punchy examples and, and companies doing different work, and then tomorrow morning there's a plenary around the topic that pulls in funders, researchers, publishers, what they're doing with data. Um, but for this session uh, here, we've got two really good examples of speakers. Um, I'm just going to give you one little insight I have um, around data I've experienced to, to maybe put a little bit of context and make you, make you think a little. Um, but at last year's Alps uh, meeting, there was um, someone called Professor Sasha Noikovich talked about the the new data native generation. Um, and as, as, as kids uh, have been taught now in high schools and from very young ages, they're, they're using technology, they're looking, thinking about data. Um, I got involved with, with Sasha after the Alps meeting and, and we had a competition where high school students were given various data sets and tools to analyze them. Um, and the insights they brought out of that data was just fascinating, the way that they were looking at things. So I'm gonna try and encourage you to think about these presentations in ways that are just, you know, be like these students, thinking about data in, in new ways. Hopefully we'll pique your interest and we really just want you to be able to go away and, and have some new insights into data. Um, I'm going to introduce both, both our speakers, um, first of all, and they're going to come up and we're going to take questions at the end. Um, Joe Karaganis is the Vice President from the American Assembly. Um, and also director of the Open Syllabus Project. So Joe's gonna be talking around real insights in what they've done in, in tracking course syllabi, and which is very relevant to yourselves as publishers where you can see in some ways how your content's been used on campus um, there. And then, and then after, after Joe, we've Ian Mulvaney, who I think probably doesn't need much introduction to you, but Ian is head of product at uh, Sage previously been head of technology at eLife, um, similar roles at Mendeley and then, and then at Nature Publishing Group. Um, so without ado and to keep us on track, I'm gonna ask Joe to come up. He's, he's got some slides and a live demo for you. So uh, that should be good. All right, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, for inviting me. Uh, it's my first time here. It's a pleasure to be here. It's um, a world we are skirting the edges of right now, but I think with this project we'll be um, developing data and applications for that data that will have a growing number of applications in and around publishing. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of this project. It's kind of a sprawling project that touches on many aspects of the teaching, publishing, sort of and library ecosystem in and around universities. Um, I won't go in any depth on most of them, but I'll just try and touch on a few, and if you want to follow up in questions, I'll be happy to dive a bit deeper. Uh, there is a live version of the project online at explore.opensyllabus.org if you want to visit and explore uh, what we've begun to data mine from around a million syllabi, collected mostly from the U.S., but there's a significant UK, UK and Canadian cl collection. Uh, the next round is going to have about four million syllabi, much greater international representation, uh, many more texts that are sort of available for discovery as we build out our bibliographical catalogs that allow us to sort of um, effectively data mine what's taught, what's taught at higher, at, at, in universities. So, you know, I'll, I'll just maybe start by showing you what that looks like. This is the first generation Syllabus Explorer. It's a very simple tool. It simply counts how often texts appear on the million syllabi in the collection. Uh, you can drill down by field, by institution, by country, by sort of reference corpus. So we began with uh, the Harvard Open Library Metadata Catalog as our sort of base catalog for finding texts in the syllabus corpus. And the, the initial approach is just brute force. Go t 
title by title through the catalog, look for a matching title in the corpus, and then try and confirm it by identifying other citation or reference information around it. And if we find that information, we say this is a citation, this, is, this counts in the syllabus, and then it counts here, and we, we break that into kind of raw count numbers. So uh, the elements of style is taught almost 4,000 times across these million class documents. And then we translate that further into a score. A one to, uh, we compress it into a 1 to 100 scale that uh, a lot, you know, provides a bit more of an intuitive grasp of how frequently things are taught in relation to each other. So you no longer have to know or care whether it's taught 700 times versus 1,700 times. It, it breaks things into a 1 to 100 score. And that, of course, is a new publication metric and one that values very different kinds of judgments that faculty make about what's important and relevant in their fields what's important to teaching as opposed to what's relevant for research citation. So we're very interested in the applications of this new publication metric that captures a very different range of judgments and a, and a very different sort of slice of the work that academics do. Uh, for teaching purposes, of course, a work that's introductory, synthetic, uh, targeting wider public audiences, all of those things that will work to the detriment of a publication for the purposes of research citation, but are very important to decisions of, about what to teach. So we think this is a significant diversification of the range of available, robust publication metrics. Um, this is all filterable by field and country and institution. A lot of, a lot of it's very rough, so don't you know, put too much stock in any particular result. There's a lot of junk data in here, but uh, it's really just the start. All the methods we use are improvable and are being improved now. And I'll show you a bit what a bit about the next generation explorer, which we'll have available hopefully within a couple of months, although these timelines have tended to slip. But to give you a sense, you can drill down into anthropology and look at the most taught anthropological texts. You can pick a text and see what texts are taught with it and with what frequency. So now we have a tool for syllabus building, a new course creation, where faculty can look up a text and see what's frequently taught with it. They can pick the obvious choices, which will be the ones that float to the top, or they can dive further down and, and look at some of the less obvious and potentially more interesting um, choices about how to combine readings. So this is, it's already a very interesting tool for syllabus building. So we launched this um, into a kind of the cultural debate in the US about canons, changing canons, the content of the curriculum, and the ways in which those are intensely politicized. So this is a subject of uh, near constant interest in the US, although arguably diminished since the 1990s. But uh, there's a lot of interest simply in what's taught, and um, you know, there's, a, there's a broader kind of great books conversation that this project plugs straight into because it ranks what's taught and ranks what you know, uh, uni university faculty think are important. Um, it got picked up immediately into these debates. Uh, Communist Manifesto ranks number three in the list. Um, Breitbart.com, I'm sure you're passingly familiar with this now because everybody uh, has to be since our lives sort of depend on what Breitbart writes now. Um, the Communist Manifesto is an interesting text because it's highly taught for unusual reasons. It's, it's highly taught because it's taught across half a dozen disciplines frequently. Very few other texts are taught across so many disciplines, sociology, philosophy, history, uh, political science. Um, and of course, it's short. So short, short texts are going to be privileged over long texts, just by the nature of course assignments. Uh, this sort of finding got picked up all over the world, really. Um, this is uh, Die Welt, uh, essentially making a joke out of the Breitbart findings that America's elite are being taught Marx for the revolution, you know? <laughs> Uh, we had a lot of fun with this during the, the first few months after launch, trying to sort of knock down the dumber versions of these stories. Um, there was some very well-meaning work that tried to pull out results like the top 100 women authors. Uh, Time Magazine produced a list of the top 100 women authors. Uh, Evelyn Waugh appeared at number 98, and um, that became a major news story in and of itself, since Evelyn, of course, is a man. and. Uh, BBC got in on the game of trying to shame the supposed illiteracy of Time Magazine for having made this, this mistake. Uh, 
you know, I, I concluded that it was a largely generational question. One of the things we were looking at was the replacement of Yves Lenoir in the curriculum by other authors uh, in such a way that very few people under 50 encounter Waugh anymore in American college English classes. But uh, the editors over 50 who enjoyed <laughs> playing this sort of shaming game uh, were, were very different. So just talking a little bit about this potential utilization as a, as a new publication metric, we've begun to see uptake of the teaching score that I mentioned earlier uh, by faculty who discover that their works are frequently taught in often unexpected ways. So of course, there's no way to know how often your work is taught in general, um, but there are works, and I think we're going to find a growing number of them that are infrequently cited but widely taught. And that's going to be something that uh, is of a great deal of interest to faculty and will be folded into promotion processes and you know, things of that sort. This is just an example of a uh, sociology professor whose work on dress codes, uh, to his surprise, <laughs> turned out to be very widely uh, assigned. Uh, we're working with the Open Textbook Network, uh, which is a sort of network of open educational resource publishers, they assemble a kind of combined library of primarily Creative Commons licensed textbooks that are, of course, then freely available. Uh, one of the problems they have is that they work in a community where all of the energy is focused on supply. You know, how can we make more and better open educational resources? Uh, but just in function of how these texts circulate, they have no account of the demand for them. So because we can count the appearance of these texts on the, in the curriculum, we can begin to provide the, the OER community and also the OA community uh, a kind of demand metric that they haven't had before. And um, especially in relation to instructional materials, this has the potential to, to close the loop, the information loop that so far has um, really stopped once, they, once the material is published. Um, now, you can under, understand the demand for an open educational textbook or an open textbook. Uh, that, can, that kind of information can begin to inform decisions about investment in those materials. And we think it has, you know, open educational resources have underperformed for a variety of reasons over the years. And one of those reasons we think is this sort of gap between information about supply and demand. So we think we can begin to address that and, and support the work uh, that open, open, open educational resource producers are doing. Uh, this is a gold mine for intellectual history of different kinds, and people have begun to pick out different stories from the data. Uh, the data, as I said, is quite rough at this stage, but uh, lots of people have, that hasn't stopped anyone really, people have sort of jumped in and begun to tease out interesting distinctions across fields. Um, you know, this is one of the, this is a cute version, I'm not sure. Oh, and you could, you could make a variety of conclusions for this, and, and it's the, 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 the project has begun to support other kinds of research into canon formation and intellectual biography in ways that we think will just get richer with time. Uh, a friend of mine did a breakdown of uh, sociology texts, uh, adding in the dates, assigning genders, and did a gender breakdown of the most recently assigned work in sociology. Uh, this is stuff that we can't do natively in the, uh, in the tool, in the online tool, because uh, the metadata that we've uh, folded into it is quite limited, but uh, as that gets better and better, we'll certainly we'll be able to roll in dates in the next round so that this kind of analysis of tracking change in assignments over time becomes something that can be done just uh, through it with a simple filter. Uh, gender, of course, is a more complicated issue. Uh, we've played around with it a bit. You can get to around 80% accuracy in terms of name, uh, name gender uh, correspondence, but 80% is not enough to publish. <laughs> so you don't want to get it wrong for those 20% of faculty who have been misassigned. But uh, this is the kind of analysis that we'll be increasingly able to produce. It'll provide a, a kind of window onto you know, the other half of university activity, teaching, that uh, really hasn't been available before. Uh, this was another little exercise that somebody did in order to try and group the works of authors in order to reach some more general conclusions about how significant authors were in the curriculum. And it reflects another data limitation that we've had where uh, we have not been able to roll up individual works into their respective authors and treat those authors as well-defined entities in the data. Uh, that's sort of pushed us into 
the field of bibliographical science and library science in ways that where we've just really been learning our way forward. Uh, the, the core problem there is to, to uh, have a structured way of representing authors, their works, and then the editions of those works, the editions and translations of those works. And building out that, those relationships is something that's been sort of at the center of bibliographical and library science for some time. We've now had to tackle that and we will have a, a I think a pretty good uh, first stab at having that sort of three-part structure in the next version of our, of our tool. Now that'll also provide the basis for moving into other languages since we can now identify translations. And right now our whole, workflow, our whole workflow is English, English language, which um, is great when the corpus is primarily US, Canada, and UK. Uh, it will begin to map the thousands of courses that are taught in English at, in other countries. So we have a large German collection, a large Spanish, Portuguese, Italian collection. Uh, thousands of classes are taught every year in English in those countries. And we'll begin to, you know, have, we'll, have, we'll have a first stab at beginning to map those curricula as well. And then we can simply just move into those languages because the workflow is pretty well defined. So this is a preview of the next generation of the tool. and. Um, you know, I can just run you through some of the basics. It's going to have a, many more filters. It's going to be much prettier. It'll be much more uh, sophisticated in terms of the kinds of things you can do with the data. Uh, it'll map change over time. It will um, allow for filtering by open access status, by data publication, by, uh, by country, by the date range of the classes taught. I mean, it's going to allow slicing and dicing of this data in many more ways. It'll have individual profile pages for faculty, for books, for publishers, so that publishers can look at the uptake of their catalogs uh, in the curriculum. And from there, we uh, need to start thinking about sustainability. And one of the, the things we are discussing is um, you know, how interesting and useful is this information for publishers? So we've, we've, we know that there are publishers who make use of it already for uh, product development, book development. Uh, the question of what the market is for a particular text is something that most faculty encounter when they submit a book proposal and they're asked to describe the market and you know, maybe they have some sense of it, but <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's a bit of a haphazard way of approaching the question of whether they're, you know, what the market for a particular book on a particular topic looks like, um, especially in the context of whether it's taught, which is often going to be the primary market. So we, we think we can provide that kind of information to faculty and be, or to, to publishers and begin to um, provide small publishers, especially more tools for understanding the landscape in which they work. I can stop. That's a logical stopping point. I can pass the pass the podium. Or okay, I'll be happy to follow up with questions in uh, after Ian's finished. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yeah, when I, when I was looking at the title, when I, when I was talking to the conference organizers about what I could come and talk about, I kind of gave them an option of about six different things that I'm currently interested in. And uh, we fit my talk into this session. And I'm not really going to talk about data, but I am going to talk about software. And I'm going to try and convince you that this is an important thing to think about in terms of making data valuable. Um, just a little background on myself. I am now head of uh, product innovation at Sage. Uh, we've just launched a new product, uh, which is online learning to teach social scientists how to code. So that kind of roughly ties into my talk. I'm hiring for product managers, so let me know. Uh, so anyway, on to the talk. When we think about research data in the publishing context, usually it comes to us as a, a final in, the, in its final form. It's complete. It's quite pretty. It, it lives in these kind of figures. But I think we've got to think about the origins of data. And so data is connected deeply to how we acquire that data. And so we have examples here of Galileo's telescope, uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope, a microscope running in a Cambridge laboratory at the moment. And as our power to collect data increases, the volume of data that we generate in sciences also is increasing radically. But it's not as simple as simply acquiring the data and then having the data in a published ready state. Uh, there are other processes that happen. We have to clean the data. Researchers have to analyze it. And increasingly, researchers are also just generating data ab initio. It's almost called in silico by running uh, uh, simulations. And the thing that all those green boxes have in common is that they're all software-based. 
And so researchers are increasingly creating software themselves to help process that data. And so what I want to convince you of is I want to convince you that we should be considering software to be a first-class citizen. And if I just present you the data now in a research context, without access to the software that went into the analysis of that data, it has less value than it would otherwise. So this is the pitch for my talk, right? It's like, you, if you have research data and you want to maximize the value of that research data, we will have to start thinking about how we bring that data together with the software pipelines that analyzed, created, and produced the results that that data is making claims around. And I, I think that in the next five years, in the next 10 years, funders are going to get increasingly interested in this domain of what we do around research software as well as research data. So we've been through like 15 years of the open access movement. We're in the middle of thinking about what we do with data as a primary object. Soon we will have to start thinking about what we do about software as a primary object. Because today, we just treat software as a file. You go to a research article, and you get a file that you download, and then you go, there you go, there's your software, good luck with that. But when you go and run software, most of the time, it breaks. It doesn't work, and it's not so good. Now, the reason it breaks is that software can be irreducibly complicated. So I want you to imagine that the little blue box at the top is the application that the author has created in order to analyze their data. Often it's going to have dependencies on other pieces of software that they have, may have written. It may require a specific version of a language. It might only run on Python 2.7, but not on Python 3.4. It might require specific libraries that are on that system that the software ran in. It might talk to a database. It might even depend on a specific operating system. Maybe it only runs on one version of Ubuntu, uh, one version of Linux. Maybe it doesn't run on Windows. So if you think, look at the picture on the right, you can think of that little app as living on a whole stack of dependencies. And so if I'm going to guarantee that I'm gonna give you this software and it's gonna work for you, I have to figure out how I can encapsulate that entire set of dependencies and give that to you as well. And software dependencies can be quite complicated. Um, now, in the software engineering world, for a number of years, there have been a bunch of different initiatives and tools to try and tackle this problem. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about two of those approaches. And I'm going to talk about the one that I'm really excited at the end. Um, but the first thing I'm going to talk about is technology called uh, virtualization, where you create a virtual machine. And Nature and the European Bioinformatics Institute in 2012 had a project called the ENCODE project. And the researchers in that project created a virtual machine that you could access, which had all of the data, all of the software, and all of the analysis that went into the papers that were published in that ENCODE project. So they used, they used a technology called uh, virtualization, and uh, the way that works is you have your computer, and then you get a little bit of software that runs inside your computer as a virtual computer. You take your dependency stack for the software you want to run, you wrap it all together into one package, and then you inject it inside your virtual computer. And so your computer is running a virtual computer inside it, which is running the entire stack of dependencies. And you don't have to worry whether or not your own computer has any of those because they're all emulated inside of the virtual computer. And yes, you can put a virtual computer inside a virtual computer if you want to, but we're not gonna go down that way. This had some problems though. So it, it solves the problem, right? It solves the problem as I have described it, but it is not maybe now the best solution. The instructions for working with this are quite complicated. The artifact that you have to download to build this uh, virtual machine is about 18 gigabytes. And that, I think you can imagine, presents some problems. If every set of papers you're publishing, you have to prepare an 18 gigabyte download, that's challenging. Uh, the, the virtual machine runs separately from the paper, so there's still a separation between where you might want to interrogate the data and where you have to go to, to examine it. And hosting at this kind of scale is gonna be expensive. So well, one technology that is making a lot of traction in the last couple of years is a technology called containers. And 
I'm going to talk about one implementation of containers, which is called Docker. And uh, Docker uh, is not the only way to do containerization, but it's kind of becoming the de facto way to do containerization at the moment. And so here I'm going to contrast the technical stack between virtualization and containers. So on the left-hand side, we have our physical hardware at the bottom, our own operating system, Windows or Mac or whatever you like. That gray layer is the thing that is going to run your virtual machine. And then you put your full stacks on top of that. And you can run one, two, three, a number of virtual machines on top of one machine. And that's the, the solution I kind of described before. In contrast, the, the, the container approach uses a way to share dependencies across applications. And so each instance of a running container takes up way, way, way less space than following the virtual machine approach. So you get lots and lots and lots of space in contrast. And so it's, much, it's considered a much more lightweight way of doing this kind of dependency management. Um, so just for some comparisons, uh, if you have one physical machine, you can think that it can usually host on the order of some tens of virtual machines. Same physical machine can host thousands of these containers. Uh, a physical machine, one virtual machine is going to take up to several minutes to, to boot up and start up. With containers, they boot up in fractions of a second. Um, and that leads to some really exciting possibilities. There are some challenges. So one thing I haven't told you about these containers is they are uh, unchanging. It, you don't, you, once you run that container, you can't change the code inside of it. You just deploy it, it runs. That's also good for preservation. But it means orchestrating a complex system where many of these containers may need to talk to each other can be a little bit complicated. Um, there's a nice analogy here, right? So in, in the software development world, Often people will create a piece of software or a server, and they'll, you know, in, and you'll get a bug report, and someone goes, "Oh, something's broken," and your engineer, your, your engineer will go and he'll fix that thing on the server, and you'll name your server, and you'll fall in love with your server, and when it gets sick, you'll try and fix it, a bit like a pet. Uh, the analogy in the container world is you treat these things like livestock, and if it gets sick, you shoot it and replace it. <laughs> so it's much easier to, to manage. Um, so we've used uh, this technology in one of our courses. We have a course that we're wor working with in collaboration with the University of Berkeley. Uh, and we're using containers to deploy a Jupyter Hub as part of that course. And so we have wrapped the data, the computation, the algorithms into a single containerized environment. And we're deploying that so our learners can go in and interact with this as they take their course which is basically something that would have been beyond our capacity to do two or three years ago. So it's really exciting. Um, here are some other organizations that you may have heard of that are using container technology. Springer Nature have it at their infrastructure layer. It's very heavily embedded. Uh, Overleaf use containers to do the conversion. When you're writing your papers and it does the conversion to PDF, a container gets spun up instantaneously, does the conversion, and then Fs off again into the background. CodeOcean have a really nice solution for how they can deploy containerized-like solutions for you. Um, I think someone will be talking about that later this afternoon. And O'Reilly are using this as a technology to build entirely new classes of products. So this is, this is a, a, a thing they're using which uh, interacts with Jupyter Notebooks, but tears apart that notebook and, and, and pulls together video, text, metadata, and code and that code can run live in the web browser for the person who's taking this, this sort of tutorial. It's a really wonderful, wonderful product. If you want to have a look at that in more detail, just Google uh, O'Reilly and Regex Golf uh, or Peter Norvig, and that'll come up. So I mentioned Google. Uh, no, I didn't, but I'm going to mention them now, right? So they spin up about 3,300 containers a second. At least that's what they were at towards the middle of last year which is about 2 billion a week. Now, aside from being a very impressive number, what's, what's actually interesting about this is they have invested very heavily over the last decade in this as a technology. And so they're producing tools to allow you to work through some of these 
questions of how you do the orchestration. As I mentioned earlier, it's a difficult problem, but people like Google have software tools that actually significantly reduce the complexity of that problem. They have a tool called Kubernetes, which is the one that we used to deploy our service. So in summary, containers can solve the problem of software dependencies. And as I said, I think that is a critical and going to become a criti critical question of how we think about how we deal with research data. They allow live coding to be delivered over the web, live interactions with data. They can wrap code data and the compute environment together. And there is a growing ecosystem of tools to support their use. The one cautionary note I, I, I mention is that they do require a slightly higher level of infrastructural sophistication than I think most standard publishers have. But that level of sophistication that you need to work with this is coming down. And if you go on my blog, uh, partiallyattended.com, I just wrote up a tutorial on how to use Kubernetes to deploy Redis onto Google Cloud, which should be easy enough to follow along, maybe. Um, I'm going to post these notes with some links later this afternoon, hopefully, and I'll tweet, tweet the link to that. Uh, and that's everything I have to say about making data valuable using containers to publish software. Thank you. Okay, so we, we have five minutes for questions if anybody has anything pressing. I mean, there, there's two very different polar sort of examples of one of insights in data and one of, of more the, the sort of structure behind the data. But do we have anybody? Yep, Ian Russell. Thanks, Ian Russell from Bioscientific. Two great talks, um, thank you very much. Uh, but this question is for Ian, and I just wondered, are there any malware issues uh, with, with the use of containers that publishers should be aware of? Um, uh, there may, there, there, there's a discussion of a theoretical issue where when two containers are running, they share, a, they, they share a shared memory space on the underlying operating system. So it's a theoretical concern that something might happen, but there's been no provable issues there. So in theory, yes, but effectively, no. Hi, uh, Andrew Smeal from Hindawi. Uh, Ian, I also wanted to ask you if you've thought about the persistence of the published code and some solutions for solving that if you wanted to make it accessible in 10 years or 50 years? Yeah, that's a really good question. In putting this talk together, I actually discovered that there's a debate on around whether these things are fit for purpose for that kind of archival uh, use because the underlying Docker system, ecosystem is evolving quite rapidly. So um, I think you would want to take a, um, an, an infrastructure as code approach as it's described. And so when you, when you build that container, basically it's a binary uh, artifact. It's like a, it's a bit of like the software that runs on top of Docker as the, as the hosting environment. But you can write a recipe to build that container and that recipe is just plain old plain text. And that plain text can be put into version control, can get a DOI, and as long as you're happy that you can capture the dependencies and archive those, then I think it's a tractable problem to solve. Yeah. I was gonna, I was gonna demo it. it it's a re re really, really cool demo, but the Wi-Fi was too slow. And then, uh, so I, just imagine it, though. It's cool. There's, oh, sorry, one more question. Yeah. I guess this is a question for both of you. Um, given the syllabus and um, software are kind of things that can be tracked for research outputs in the future and build metrics around them and that kind of thing, how do you think um, things like DOIs and ORCIDs can be used within both those systems just so that you can link research outputs to the people and the places that have um, been the originators? Take a first stab at that. I mean, this, is, this is a problem we're, trying, we're dealing with right now. Uh, we are using uh, ORCIDs, ORCID IDs, for uh, trying to establish stable identities for authors with respect to their works. Uh, that's great for the narrow slice of fields in which ORCID has some traction. It doesn't help at all with the history of publishing going back 50, 60, 70 years, which is really where the, you know, we're struggling to uh, merge effectively two different systems for author identification. The other one that has uh, quite a bit of validity is VIAF, the Virtual Identity Author File. So we are, you know, the, that's one of the data, data sets that we're using to try and uh, supplement and combine with ORCID uh, in order to have some reasonably solid representation of author identi identities. So, so the, stuff, the stuff I was showing, I really wanted to show it more as a provocation to get people to think about the kinds of potential that these 
classes of technologies have to allow us to think about how we can do a great job around delivering these artifacts in the future. But today, the way we, we deliver software, it is absolutely possible to get the authors of that software to deposit their software into a repository, a uh, software repository like uh, Git or Bitbucket, and then acquire a DOI for that. And that then allows for all of the downstream capturing of, of citation and reuse that you would need. And, and so if you're doing anything with software right now today along the lines of associating it with your publications, you should absolutely should be looking at how you can assign DOIs to that software today. You don't have to worry about any of the stuff I've talked about, but go away and do that right now. Yeah. All right. Sorry, can I just add one quick thing? Sure. Um, this is, I'm, I'm at Crossref, so I just wanted to add that um, you mentioned ORCIDs and the problem of disambiguating and assigning for um, authors. And for the works themselves, getting um, DOIs matched up to the text, um, our system is very ready and accommodating to, to uh, retrieve those DOIs. And, and Crossref is what we're building the next round on, really. Yeah. All right, so I, I think we're gonna, we've got a very short five minute break. For those that don't need to leave the room, maybe easy not, but we, the next set of speakers are gonna come up. Um, first of all, let's give a round of applause for Ian and Joe. <laughs> Thank you.